In this video, I will be talking about the Three Kingdoms period of China, focusing on the many talented heroes of that time. Ma Chao was a general of questionable character from Yu Fu Feng Commandery, the first son of Ma Teng and whom later came to serve under Liu Bei of Shu. He was a descendant of the famed Ma Yuan, who was a prominent general in Chinese history. Honed in military and political affairs, he aided Emperor Guan Wu in reuniting the Han Empire by subjugating uprisings from the Trung sisters and Wu Lin tribes. Ma Yuan upheld strict discipline and respected those around him regardless of status. Unlike his descendant Ma Chao, who not only took up arms against the Han government, which technically was under control of Tao Tao at the time, but also gained infamy for betraying his father when he convinced Han Sui to join his rebellion. He also once left his wife and son behind when he joined Liu Bei and murdered Jiang Xu's mum after she had criticised his treacherous nature. Later, after the wedded couple Zhao Ang and Wang Yi turned against Ma Chao, he answered back by murdering their son. Back when the Han Empire was united, Ma Chao's grandfather married into the Kuiang tribes from Liang province, and by the time Ma Chao was born in 176, the Ma clan had grown to be very influential within the region. In the year 197, at the age of 21, Ma Chao received an invitation to serve under Tao Tao as a member of the Han government. Tao Tao presumably knew of his ancestry and wanted to recruit him to slowly bring the Ma clan back into the realm, but Ma Chao instead declined Tao Tao's offer. Two years after the Battle of Guangdu in 202, Tao Tao launched a northern campaign against Yuan Shao's sons. Tao Tao ordered Zhong Yao, a government official of his, to recruit troops from Liang province, then to engage Yuan Tan's army at Pingyang County. The Yuan forces were being led by Gao Gan and Guo Yuan. They were well disciplined and eager to fight. Ma Chao and Pang Dei were sent by Ma Teng in response to Zhong Yao's summons in assisting Tao Tao's army. The battle got underway and Ma Chao was hit in the foot by an arrow but wrapped the wound in a pouch and bravely continued fighting. Meanwhile, Pang Dei had beheaded Guo Yuan in battle without even realising it until after the fighting was over. Around the same time, Ma Teng fell out with Han Sui and asked to be relocated to the capital city which was granted by the Han government. This led to Ma Chao getting a few promotions, whilst also inheriting his father's army, but at the same time his brothers, Ma Xu and Ma Tai, were also ordered to bring their entire families to the capital city as well. Around nine years later, in 211, Tao Tao launched an attack against Zhang Lu in Hanzhong, and began marching his armies through Guangzhou. Ma Chao and other warlords from Liang feared Tao Tao was marching to invade them, and so Ma Chao urged Han Sui to join him in forming the coalition from lands west of Tong Pass. Ma Chao went on to disown his own father whilst convincing Han Sui to adopt him as a son. This move disgruntled many, but went ahead nonetheless. Ma Chao rallied a hundred thousand men to his cause, which included Yang Kui, Li Kan, Cheng Yi, Hu Xuan, Cheng Yin, Zhang Heng, Liang Xing and Ma Wan. As Ma Chao's name grew in fame, he attracted the attention of Liu Zhang from Yi province, who sought to marry his daughter off to Ma Chao, but Liu Zhang's administrators advised against the idea, stating, although Ma Chao was brave, he lacked humanity and was untrustworthy. Tao Tao led his armies towards Tong Pass, where he sent Xu Huang and Zhu Ling across the Wei River, whilst he himself headed for a more northern crossing. Ma Chao pre-empted Tao Tao's position and assaulted his army as they attempted to board their ferries. Tao Tao stayed seated, calm and did not move. Zhang He frantically rushed to his lord's aid and safeguarded him onto a ferry, which sailed across the river at great speed due to the direction of the wind and the strong current. Ma Chao began firing down on the Wei army with volleys of arrows. This was encountered by a colonel of Tao Tao's who released horses and cattle onto the battlefield. This tactic distracted Ma Chao's soldiers, who left their positions at the chance of free livestock. When Tao Tao was discovered to be safe by the rest of his generals, he remarked, I was almost trapped by that little scoundrel today. Ma Chao continued to harass the Wei forces as they continued to cross the river. Tao Tao used a combination of dummy soldiers, pontoon bridges, sandbag walls and ambushes to assist his army in crossing. 
It is noted Han Sui had lost a debate with Ma Chao before the battle about where to engage Tao Tao. Ma Chao was correct in predicting his enemy's movements, and when Tao Tao learned of this disagreement, he stated, If the young horse doesn't die, I can't have a proper burial place. I presume what Tao Tao meant by this is that unless Ma Chao dies, he will never leave Tao Tao alone, nor allow him to rest in peace. The coalition forces repeatedly attempted to lure Tao Tao's forces into fights, but he did not move his army. Ma Chao then traded lands and a hostage in an attempt to sue for peace with Wei, but under the suggestion of Ji Yashu, Tao Tao fooled Ma Chao by accepting the offer but not upholding his end of the deal. This also gave the Wei army time to prepare for battle, whilst Ma Chao's army was at ease. When Tao Tao launched his attack, they stood little chance of victory and were forced to retreat. Throughout the Battle of Tong Pass, Tao Tao expressed joy whenever an enemy army engaged them, as Guangzhong was a vast area. Every army that appeared took weeks off of how long it would take to pacify if they were positioned in the most strategic locations. After the battle was won, Tao Tao remarked at how much easier it was than he expected. Next, Tao Tao met with Han Sui, who both used to work together in Luoyang. They reminisced about their fathers both being nominated as civil servant candidates, and other pastimes they had together. Not once did they discuss their military strategy regarding their current conflict. Ma Chao became suspicious of Han Sui, because when he returned to camp, he was awfully quiet about his interaction with Tao Tao. Ma Chao and others accompanied Han Sui the next time they met with Tao Tao. Ma Chao intended to capture Tao Tao when he got close enough, but upon meeting him, he had set up wooden horses in a wall-like fashion to safely distance himself from his enemy. It is said that Zhu Chu, Tao Tao's bodyguard, glared at Ma Chao the whole time, nullifying Ma Chao's plan to capture Tao Tao. The coalition soldiers creeped forward. Tao Tao remarked, You wish to see how I look? I am also an ordinary person. I don't have four eyes or two mouths, but I am more intelligent. Later, Tao Tao wrote a craftily written letter that showed evidence that it had been tampered with and then sent it to Han Sui. This deepened Ma Chao's suspicions of Han Sui when the other coalition members discovered it. At the same time, Tao Tao scored a major victory against them, where many of their generals were killed. This victory subdued the Guangzhong region for Wei and forced Ma Chao to retreat into the Yang province. In early 211, Tao Tao reached An Ding and then gave up on his pursuit of Ma Chao as his attention was needed elsewhere. He left Shi Hao Yuan to defend Chang'an, as it was highly likely that Ma Chao would return. Emperor Xi'an soon ordered the execution of the Ma family members in Yi, which resulted in over 200 deaths, and almost wiped the Ma clan out. Ma Chao had time to easily build up his army from the diverse tribes within the region, and some aid from Zhang Lu, whereafter he started a campaign to retake Liang province. In the year 213, Ma Chao led his much larger force to siege Ji Cheng, which housed the inspector of Liang province, Wei Kang. Wei Kang's defence held firm for eight months under the leadership of Yang Yui, who believed a relief force was on its way. A respected elder was sent by Wei Kang to request aid from Xie Hao Yuan, but he was captured by Ma Chao. Ma Chao struggled to make use of the captive. When he was sent to the castle walls to demoralise the defenders by telling them that no reinforcements were on the way, he in fact said the opposite, and to keep holding until they arrive. Ma Chao then tried to recruit the old man, but he stubbornly refused, which led to an argument between the two, resulting in Ma Chao executing him. This act of violence intimidated Wei Kang enough that he allowed Ma Chao to enter the city. Once inside, Ma Chao ordered Zhang Lu's officer, Yang Ang, to murder Wei Kang and the city's administrator, and dictated that the residing generals of the city were now under his command. By the ninth month, Xie Hao Yuan was eventually given permission by Tao Tao to relieve Ji Cheng, who did not realise the city had already been lost. Ma Chao engaged Xie Hao Yuan outside of the city and scored a great victory, which further strengthened the support Ma Chao received from the local tribes. Ma Chao had now secured himself a shaky foundation to govern from, which soon slipped through his fingers, as disgruntled old subordinates of Wei Kang conspired against him. Ma Chao was advised to put down a rebellion launched by Zhao Ang and Wang Yi. The moment Ma Chao, his younger cousin Ma Dai, and Pang Dei left Ji Cheng, Ma Chao's family was rounded up and executed. Ma Chao's army arrived to put down the rebellion, but they were lured into an ambush army led by Zhao Ang 
and then surrounded by a third army led by Xie Hao Yuan. Ma Chao retreated back to where he began pursuing the rebels. He was greeted by a volley of arrows. He almost fell off his horse in anger when he witnessed his wife's corpse thrown from atop the castle walls. He made his way back to Ji Cheng, where they deceived the night guards into allowing them back into the city. They began to slaughter all suspects who betrayed them, including Ji Yangshu's mother and son. Ji Hao Yuan arrived the next day, which forced Ma Chao, Ma Dai, and Pang Dei to retreat. They encountered Yang Fu, another who had turned against them, and so Ma Chao charged him in a furious rage, wounding him five times, but not managing to kill him. The three eventually travelled to Zhang Lu in Han Zhong, where they were well received and could borrow more troops. A furious Ma Chao marched north again to seek revenge against Jiang Shu, Zhao Ang, and Wang Yi in a siege at the Battle of Mount Kui, but were driven off by Tao Tao's reinforcements, led by Jia Hao Yuan and Zhang He. Ma Chao headed back to Han Zhong, back to the warm welcome of Zhang Lu, who almost gave him his daughter's hand in marriage. There are two quotes regarding what was said by Zhang Lu's advisors to dissuade him of this. The first is, if a person can't even love his family and relatives, can he still love others? And, a man like that, who has no love for even his parents, cannot love another. New Year's Day came around, and Ma Chao was greeted by a relative, which greatly surprised him. He beat his chest and stated, A big family with over a hundred members all sharing the same fate in one day. Now there are too few of us to give greetings to each other. Ma Chao spent the next few months borrowing Zhang Lu's soldiers in failed northern attacks to try and recapture Liang province. He ended up irritating an officer of Zhang Lu's who sought to harm him. Ma Chao eventually gave up and moved away to live with the Di people from the area. In the year 214, Liu Bei was mid-conflict with Liu Zhang over control of Yi province. Ma Chao had grown tired of Zhang Lu's unambitious nature, and so wrote a letter to Liu Bei expressing his desire to break faith with Zhang Lu and to join Liu Bei. At some point during Ma Chao's defection, he killed Zhang Lu's subordinate called Yang Bai and brought Ma Dai along with him, but left his second wife Lady Dong and his son Ma Kui behind. It's noted that Zhu Ge Liang had faith in Ma Chao's abilities regarding civil and military affairs, whilst comparing him to Zhang Fei, but not as proficient as Guan Yu. Liu Bei welcomed Ma Chao's proposal and so sent troops and supplies to bolster his unit, who then joined the assault on Chengdu. Within 10 days of Ma Chao joining the battle, Liu Zhang opened the city gates and surrendered, although this was aided by a discussion between Xi'an Yong and Liu Zhang, who were familiar friends before the war. Ma Chao was then put in charge of Lin Zhu, and held the title of General Who Pacifies the West for the next five years. In 219, Liu Bei declared himself King of Han Zhong after his successful campaign to capture Han Zhong from Tao Tao, whereafter he assigned Ma Chao as General of the Left. Two years passed, then Liu Bei declared himself Emperor to preserve the Han Dynasty by forming the Shu Han State. Ma Chao was promoted to the Mark Kui of Tai District and the Governor of Liang Province. The letter sent to Ma Chao by Liu Bei reads, I am unworthy, but I have ascended the throne to preserve the Han Dynasty. Tao Tao and Tao Pi will be remembered for their sins. I am disconsolate by their wrongdoings. The people loathe them and hope that the Han Dynasty will be restored, with the Di, Qiang, Shunyu, and other ethnic minorities willingly submitting to our rule. The Northerners look up to you, and your valour is well known amongst them. I have an important task for you. I hope you will use your influence to govern the northern border well, and bring prosperity to the people there. You must show them the benefits of our government, and be impartial in rewarding the good and punishing the evil. You have the blessings of the Han emperors, and you must not let the people down. A disgruntled official named Peng Yang was being reassigned away from Chengdu, and went to visit Ma Chao before he left. Ma Chao paid compliments towards Peng Yang, whilst recognising that his departure takes him further away from his career goals. Peng Yang agreed to that fact, and that he was also unhappy about it, and then went on to be misunderstood by Ma Chao when he said, You are outside, while I am inside. Ma Chao, who was now reforming his character to be more honourable, saw this as an invitation to betray Liu Bei, and so reported it to officials, which led to the execution of Peng Yang. He claimed what he really meant was that they could both support Liu Bei, Ma Chao from the front lines, and himself from within the state. 
Ma Chao supposedly had a close call with Guan Yu and Zhang Fei, who wanted to have him executed for calling Liu Bei by his courtesy name, Zhuan Di, but Liu Bei refused to order his death. The case mentions a banquet where Liu Bei sat with his sworn brothers stood behind him, carrying swords. It is said Ma Chao changed his attitudes around Liu Bei after seeing this and hearing of the two brothers' desire to have him killed. Pei Song Ji, a historian who lived 150 years later in the Eastern Jin Dynasty, disputes this case as untruthful and nonsensical with a few points. Firstly, there is a letter that Guan Yu wrote to Zhu Ge Liang which said, Who can compete with Ma Chao? Which the historian highlights as an inconsistency. Pei Song Ji goes on to state how Guan Yu was left to defend Jing province and so never set foot in Yi, let alone side by side with Zhang Fei and Liu Bei. He questions how Ma Chao even knew that they wanted to have him killed, or how by them standing on guard with swords is anything out of the ordinary. His final point is he believes Ma Chao would have known the rules on when and where he can use each name, and states the records written by Yuan Wei and Yue Ji are disorganised, unreliable and nonsensical. Ma Chao passed away in the year 222 in unknown circumstances. He wrote a letter to Liu Bei on his deathbed which read, over 200 members of my family were killed by Tao Tao. I only have my cousin, Ma Dai, left with me. He will be the one to continue my family line. I entrust him to your majesty's care, that is all I have to say. If you enjoyed my video, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, and I'll see you next time.